the colloquium at Stanford, the unfinished revolution. And I need to repeat periodically that when I say the unfinished revolution, I'm not talking about my personal revolution. It's a revolution the world has yet to go through and it isn't finished. And a good purpose of what we're trying to talk about here is trying to make a picture of what that revolution could be in a strategic way in which all you warriors can go about doing it. But um, one thing to announce at the outset is that uh, it turns out around the world enough people have been listening and coming back with comments and questions, etc., that it's totally overwhelmed our, our staff ability to cope with it. So anybody out there or here that hasn't had personal answers, please don't feel slighted. We're just delighted. But somehow we're not quite clear how we're going to marshal the resources. A lot of it's people power and which somewhat takes more money in order to uh, sort of make a cooperative, coordinated way in which the dialogue can get going. It was one of our purposes explicitly to try to elicit and develop a dialogue around here as a real prototype, hoping that the stimulus of the colloquium and the interaction we could produce during the time would help develop a community out there. But uh, it, the flood is sort of making it hard for us. And uh, uh, Peter Yim has been doing a marvelous job over here of uh, coordinating and, and putting together software to try to help it and management, etc. Do you have anything to add, uh, Peter, that you'd like to tell anybody? You, you might like to take the opportunity to introduce your two teaching assistants. Most of the class will be working with them one way or the other. Yeah, Shortly. good idea. That we we actually since since here in seminars at Stanford they often appoint teaching assistants, which is a formal thing. And I've been gone from the university so long that it's hard for me to get back on gear. But one of our teaching assistants is Marcelo Hoffman here. He's a little bit bedraggled looking old guy for a equivalent of a student. <laughs> but he's been serving voluntarily and he's off hours, which has gotten longer and longer, to help coordinate, the, try to develop the community as a interacting. And then Hilary Lamont, who isn't here, but she's in Washington, D.C., where she works, is coordinating the content sort of thing of the repository that we're building. And Peter's doing a lot of the support service, and Frode Hegland over there is also contributing. And then our prize we got this year from Japan is Shinya Yamada. <laughs> His father donated him, and uh, <laughs> it's just terrific. So anyway, these are the staff, and uh, I wish we had 50 people. Later on, I'll try to point out the kind of picture we have of how a repository actually could work and what it's for and what would be in it. And uh, the dynamics of it are sort of represent one of the big challenges in today. So uh, the way the colloquium is going to work is there are a whole set of concepts and all that are sort of intertwined to make a strategic framework. And I've tried for years to just go through them, and in one sitting it doesn't seem to soak in. So I'm going to play tricks on you. I'm, a lot of times I'm going to go by the same slides in different sequences to kind of show you the interactions as they do. And uh, one of the personal problems I have is, uh, I keep thinking as I get older, my memory doesn't work so well. But I really got my comeuppance about eight years ago when my wife, she'd heard that once too many and she says, the trouble with you, Doug, is you can't remember how bad your memory used to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so you've got that. So I may go buy things twice because I've forgotten about them but, uh, that I told you already. But I, really I'm purposely trying to do that because um, they're like that. So it'll take several passes. So anyway, there's a fair amount of history back in the, through all the years, and some of it would be worth bringing out from time to time because it makes a difference, uh, sort of why it evolved like it did. And there are a lot of experiences which I don't want to get to be like, oh, poor Doug, look at he got squashed here or pushed out the door here or ignored there. There's a very, very important thing we're going to hit all the time is prevailing paradigms. And these are examples, you know, it's when, when the corporate vice president for information technology at McDonnell Douglas had uh, given 
some of the volunteers who wanted to make this work within the company. And we'd spent a year making plans, interacting on how, how this kind of interlinking could go on between the knowledge work support and the computer-aided design and the manufacturing and got enthusiastic people and sort of it. And we go back to the corporate vice president. We said, okay, you told us if we could get this moving this far, then you'd do something. Well, I'll tell you guys, he's a very earthy fellow. Uh, I think I've changed my mind. He says, I talked to uh, IBM and DEC and Hewlett Packard and none of them knows anything about this. It links, he used a nice expression, that barnyard expression about what links were like. None of them knows anything about that. So I don't see how the hell I can start investing in this. Thing. So bingo, they want a year. <laughs> we, learned, we learned a lot, but there have been a lot of those things, just what you're up against. So one of the real questions during the time we're bringing this colloquium out is, are there paradigms out there and within the community people wanting to watch this, are they suitable? Have they sort of shifted in a way so what we're saying now will take root and grow? And if they aren't, well, we brush our hands and try again. <laughs> I mean, as long as we can get support for trying again. So anyway, the, uh, there's a lot of relevant stuff that's our website, and here's the URL. And has anybody, I mean, I, I assume everybody's found out that you can go directly to getting the sequence of slides online with your browser. So you can step through and review old slides and you can actually make a URL to make a link to any one of those slides that you wish, which is an important feature that if people get into dialogue, they can send an email with a link pointing to a particular slide. And this invoked the kind of dialogue we could do about it. So the other side of that is what do we do if we get a whole bunch of things like that. <laughs> One of the things if we could assess them well enough now would be that, that you know, people go and digest it and stuff and they tell me that here are the kind of concepts that seem to be missing and there's a lot of contention out there about your statements about this and uh, either I'll retreat and say oops or I'll, I'll come back and try to clarify, to resolve it. But um, that's a downstream thing sometimes. So as also when we go through, we'll be talking more and more about the issues about these improvement communities of which what we're trying to launch is a special kind. And uh, that, so you'll see the sort of dynamics that we expect and the issues that are raised in there. And one of the particular issues of the community we're trying to build is how do you learn about the problems and the challenges and the opportunities and the techniques and the processes, et cetera, that will let a distributed community of people that are trying to do an improvement <coughs> attack, how they can cooperate and work better. So that's our pursuit. Um, so anyway, so the next next plus, a couple of slides from now, you're actually going to start seeing a few, a few extracts from going and looking at web. And Shenya helped extract a web picture and pasted a URL over it so you could see it. So, so a couple of different signs, and I'll probably use that more and more during the course of the seminar. But this, one of these talks about the library. We just call it a quote. It's a, it's a, 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 a couple of pages in, the, in our web in which we list a bunch of the different reference materials that are there. So throughout all the years that we were active, beginning 1960, right on in through uh, 89, very active out there, then in the 90s a little bit more, et cetera, that we were publishing reports and papers, and a lot of the papers have been put on the web, and uh, so there's a lot of reference material there that we can point to from time to time. So we'll go now just to sort of see that there's one little thing that we need to point out is in his the history of what we're going to tell about, we will talk about two two interactive linked systems called one of them is called NLS and the other is called Augment. Well, they were both the same. It was just at a particular time in uh, history that we got moved out of SRI where we'd done all the research world and building it, and we'd called it NLS up to that point. And then we went to the commercial world, which was all we could do to save all that work and, and system, et cetera, uh, because the research world dried up. So then the, uh, public, the uh, publicity or marketing guys that went commercially, they said, let's get a new name for this. NLS is too weak. So they named it Augment, because we've been talking about augmenting the human intellect, et cetera. So that was nice. So it's the same system. 
So uh, Augment's been, been there, and I still use it, if you believe it or not, because there are so many things in it that can do things that you just can't get elsewhere today, uh, which is diminishing some. And the interface between my working in that world and the modern up-to-date one is getting more awkward. So anyway, we'll have times we can show you. But one of the features in Augment was that every object in any document was always addressable explicitly with the address you could put into a link. So your links could point to a word, a character, a paragraph. You could even designate a branch that you were talking about, you know, which would be a section or a chapter or the whole document. And it was even more than that, that your link address could take a root and it got there where you were pointing at would be another link. And you put in something in your address that said, when you get that link, take it. So you could do this indirect linking, which just had real power that you could you know, develop processes and procedures in that human system side of how you could work with that. So one of the things then is when we, when we printed it out, we would usually print out the actual hierarchical location number on it. So we formed the habit of when we were publishing something, if the editors would let us, we would put those little numbers at the end of every paragraph. So then we found a way that if when they go out to the HTML that those are actually a, a address tag. So you can put that number at the end with a pound sign and it'll go right to any given paragraph and the things we published like that. So that's what you'll see in here. And there's some much fun things beyond that too that we're making them a dynamic thing that they point to themselves. So is a link. So you put your cursor over that and you can elicit what the URL address would be to point right to it. But more than that, you can click on it and it hoists it right to the top, which is what we used to use all the time in NLS and Augment. And that, you know, scrolling has its advantages, but when you want to just go right to something, especially if you want to link to it, it's just very much useful. So you'll see some evidence of that. So here's, here's the, you are looking at this URL at the top, which isn't part of the, the browser picture, points exactly to this branch two. And you see all here lined up like this. And these are the array of linkable uh, addresses. And the one that we've pre-fired, so it's in red, is to a paper published in 1992 called Toward High Performance Organizations, A Strategic Role for Groupware. And it goes through quite a few of the steps we're doing in here in the detail in there. Talking about scaling, talking about improvement infrastructures, talking about things. And so you can go back there and get a lot more detail and elicit questions from it. But in, in amongst the rest of these things, they're just very, very interesting. I'm almost tempted to click on some of them, but <laughs> this authorship provisions in 1984 was a very detailed description of Augment and its structuring and the conventions for addressing and all, many, many of the things that are in there. And others going back here. And the bottom one, Augmenting Human Intellect, a conceptual framework in 1962, was that report that I waved in front of you last week. And uh, it's really interesting that some group of his, you know, technology historians in Germany converted it to the web form and did a very, very nice job, even with the diagrams that show all the feedback loops and the planning, etc. So as old as it is, it's still full of good things, even though some of the terminology will make you wince a little bit because it's so old. So anyway, so anyway then the next thing here is a jump from there to that cited paper takes you to this document and we talk about journal. So you see in here, it's got a, an address, it's Augment 132.811. So one of the things we initiated in 1970 was something we call a journal, in which anything you submitted to it, a one-liner or a big, big document, would go in there and guarantee to be delivered back, and they would give you and assign you a serial number of it, which was good, and you didn't have to know the pathway to that, all you had to know is which journal and what the number was and you'd get it back and you were guaranteed it would be like it was when you did it. So as a matter of managing your knowledge and keeping track of things, it was just a big, big step ahead. And something like that is, is needed very badly in the world out there. If you ever make links to things in a serious sense and they move the document around a little bit, you're in, in trouble. So anyway, so that's there every time and then you can see the purple numbers out here. And so the next one follows a purple number that's talking about 
the uh, uh, so that anyway, I've already told you about all this. <laughs> So anyway, this follows the link that goes down inside that document to particular, what we call a branch. And so that's very much what Augment could do, but it would do even more. That it said, you had viewing options. We said, look, when you've got the computer supporting you, let's, let's don't just use it like a, a word processor they did. It's what you see on the screen is what you're going to have on paper. Well, look, you've got much, much more opportunities. Let's have then put on the screen under control flexibly all kinds of views that help you study and assess what's there. So one of the very first ones we did was a view that would either show open like this or just show me the first line of every paragraph, which turned out to be very, very useful and had a side benefit that people started doing what good writing policy is supposed to set up, that they'd put more in the first line that would tell you more or less what the paragraph is about because they know people would be scanning at one line only and they do that. So there were other things. How many d d levels down in the hierarchy would you show? What kind of, show me only those things that have a certain content. And the structure we put on it was very flexible because in a hierarchical structure, every, all the brothers and sisters at the same level, you could take a look at that and then you could start sorting on it. Or you could do content analysis that we would, I'd like to, I'd like to go in that file and sh pick up every paragraph that's down at a certain level, has a certain content and don't bother indenting it, just put it flat. And when you do it, put something on the end that tells me where it came from, a link. Or I can go through, out through other documents like that and say, hey, I like this piece of text. So you set it all up, so you pick out that text and it gets installed in a list that you've created someplace that you don't have to keep in sight with a link in the end from where it came. Then you get a bunch of those done and you start massaging them, moving them around and adding notes to it. You did a very good job of researching and everything, every kernel that came from someplace, you know where, you can go back when you want it. So there were many, you know, it, it takes it take day after day of showing you things and letting you try it to kind of get it across. So that's been sitting there all these years and we wave our hands to the world and we slowly realize that, that the momentum that's there now and the, the sort of paradigms that are there that, hey, what's there is the latest. And it started out with a very simple thing and with WYSIWYG, et cetera, and they're hung up in those things. So. How do you get the world sort of oriented about giving some explicit evolutionary process by which they can go try and explore more things that are, that are in, in the span of things out in that frontier that you could go to that aren't something set aside. So it's going to take some real planning and thinking to try to get an evolutionary process that lets you have something that can really, you know, in a practical world, produce the kind of evolution that this scale of of thing has to have. So here's just diving into another one. And every figure, it has an address too, bingo, down there, such as that. So we didn't have the kind of graphic capabilities you do today, but anyway, I just thought I'd give you a flavor of this. And later on in the colloquium, we're going to be talking more about, about these kinds of capabilities, trying to say that the way in which these kind of capabilities and more and better can evolve in the world has, has to be some different way from they'll only come out with things that'll sell a bunch and that'll be only if it's easy enough for somebody to learn in the current state of frenzy, etc. So, so anyway, there's just a plan. You have to have it realistically according to the way people work and get motivated. But this is one of the, one of the things of just sort of also among the paradigms one of the things is how much, how much different and how much more powerful can our environment be from what it is today? And uh, you know, sometimes I think it's almost as if when they invented writing, they didn't want to go away from the stone tablet because somehow that was real, see? And uh, that would have crippled us a little bit, wouldn't it? Okay. So here's one you've seen before, and you'll see it again. So this goal has been motivating all the time. As much as possible to boost mankind's collective capability for coping with complex, urgent problems. Okay, so what we're going to do in here now is review some of the core set of concepts and the vocabulary terms that provide what I call the strategic framework associated with the pursuit of that goal. Okay, so you've been exposed to a bunch of them before. Here's another slice through. 
right, so these are some of the terms, et cetera, and concepts. Organizations as social organisms. That this, this came out, gee, 30 years ago to just say, hey, they are. And this new nervous system that the digital technology will provide is going to offer really significant evolution in those organisms. See? So then we move to say, one of the very important aspects of your organization is its capability infrastructure. And uh, this had importance because looking at it like that, you could point out how many places in that infrastructure could new technology make a difference. And if it does it at lower levels, then it would probably enable restructuring the higher levels, which in turn would allow the restructuring of the even higher ones, etc. And augmentation about just pointing out in a world how much we're already augmented and that what we'd be like if we didn't have all the things we list as part of your augmentation system, you'd be a uh, speechless, primitive person that could only... <laughs> yeah, you'd probably, you'd probably speak, because language, but that's already augmented you a lot. And then the co-evolution frontier, because when we talk about this sort of technology, artifact, etc. system and the human system side, those things are going to co-evolve between them and within them very much. So this constant co-evolution that's going on has to be something that you look at. How many different elements in that whole system are simultaneously evolving? Which makes organizational improvement, organizational evolution, etc. just a lot more complex than like that. And the huge effects of the prevailing paradigms. Just, just very, very much. So, so you'll be part of an experience or experiment here now. So trying to come out in the world and tell the world, hey, there's something, something here that looks like there's a lot of good reasoning and concepts, et cetera, around with taking a new perspective, resetting your paradigms. So let's just see what happens. You know, at the end of these six weeks or something, there may be a lot of confusion and a lot of griping and, and some barbs thrown like that and maybe nothing will happen. But on the other hand, by the end of this particular session, I want to tell you about the kind of things I'd like to see happening. So anyway, this is the one that we developed last week. And um, this central thing of a capability infrastructure representing the sort of thing that you have to work on if you're really going to change, change this to, in this goal. And based upon the very basic human capabilities you have here, who interact with these capabilities and with the paradigms, organization, procedures, methods, and with all of the tools, etc., like this. So all this dynamics is there to support what you have as a basic human capability and what you you get conditioned for your social reflexes, etc., and uh, you have to think and learn and knowledge you have to have. So you have to have skills and just latent knowledge, etc., in order to operate within that. But that's that's the whole thing that gives you any real capability and or gives your organizations. And this model shows you could look at this as a human, an individual human, or it could take any organization you want to and plunk it in here. And this is at least this is my contention. So I've been living it long enough so I can say this wildly and loosely. So it would be very interesting if we could get more dialogue going and people start saying, where could this go? dig down into it in there and dig down into capability infrastructures because the picture I've always had is saying, well, look, maybe here's a, a very vital you know, capability and then get an organization for making it run. And it's dependent upon quite a set of sub-capabilities. Well, so is this one over here dependent upon some of the same ones. So if one of those subordinate capabilities suddenly got boosted way up, hey, many of the ones above it could it then be looking forward to re-engineer them or re recombine how those capabilities are formed or improve the kind of capability there, which would then damn, which would then move on up to the top. So the whole corporate, organizational, personal, whatever you're going to talk about, capability is just a lot of evolution going on simultaneously in there. And it it's been happening all the generations that we kind of can be aware of. Except that nowadays the, the sort of transitional rate and the sophistication that's happening on this side just transcends anything that ever happened before. And I keep saying, look, the only thing I can think of that was qualitatively similar, that means it made 
the kind of change throughout all the social structure and practices that this can happen in the world. The only thing I can think of is when the hunter-gatherers discovered uh, our agriculture and, oh, that invention changed tremendously the whole social structure, the language, the practices, the family relationships, everybody else, you know, like that. So, that's, that's what I think. They say, like the printing press? No, the printing press was kind of feeble compared to what this is going to be, or any other thing you can think of that was in the modern. So like, well, that's my contention. So, it'd be very interesting if I got people with, they're a lot smarter about history and dynamics and, and anthropology, et cetera, than I am, that would try to help think this through and make the models. But in other words, if, if we don't get some shared picture like this among the active paradigms in the world, that there really, really is something explosive going to happen there, then, then the kind of efforts that need to be applied to, to sort of dig in and cope with it, what's coming, won't get, won't get exercised until things get pretty late. So anyway, and this is one of the talks here for bringing the energy story back here is saying, all right, you know, there's something that you can point to that really is. There are a lot of things you can point to that are really important. And how do you get the world's paradigm shifting enough so that they take it seriously? And then if they do, what are you going to do about it? How do you marshal the kind of cooperative solution development and execution that, that's required? So, who knows? Well, they're, they're sitting there tell, waiting to tell you the answer. <laughs> So anyway, then we went on to say, if in a very simplified way you took these two d dimensions of tool system and human system and watched the way the tools developed and harnessed like that, and here's sort of the best that's anticipated today, and in 20 years you might anticipate way out there, so that all through the his history, the evolution went on there, and this population today in the world probably occupies some domain about like this. And people get used to the fact that, well, in 20 years the technology is going to move out like that, and yeah, there are different other things to do it, so we're going to be moving out here, you know, you know one square every 50 years or something of that sort. Um, so the, then the question was, well, hey, what if it's more like that, that the technology has made this big spurt? And this might get people's attention if they really sort of could see it like that. So how do we get help from people that can help detail this out to say, let's try to detail this and let's try to see how many different dimensions there are in each of these so to know this is a multi-dimensional space, not just two-dimensional, but out there is out there. And the pathway for any given organization to migrate as they're trying to cope with the changes out there and change themselves and their capabilities and practices, etc., is going to be something. So it'd be very easy in this multi-dimensional space out there to get wandered off and get lost and find yourself in a dead end. So it would be extremely important to, to every organization to try to help be helped getting a picture out there that's sort of developed. And it's a picture that itself is going to take a great deal of intellectual knowledge work, cooperative work to try to develop the picture. The picture of what's happening now and of the different paths that different people are advocating. And then what happened to them in the last year since they advocated and took a path, etc. And what are the paths open to you, your organization? And how much is it going to cost? And how in the world do you convince the people that provide the funds for your organization? If it's a corporation, something especially, but anything else too, some organization. How do you get the funds to move in that world? Because the pro questions are, you may be, get stuck so you become obsolete. And so then your organization evaporates. Well, maybe it deserved it or something, but on the other hand, maybe it provides a very important service to the world that who's going to fill the gap? And that'll be a problem for the rest of the world to take care of. So, if your government doesn't start moving in its ability to cope and support the citizenry, then it might find itself in a similar way. Well, anyway, looking at that closely, I came to the conclusion that this picture, you're right, it, it really isn't very accurate. This is the one we ought to use. See, that the relative change out there of what's anticipatable, and a lot of that's depending upon both the digital explosion, but also the nanotechnology and its impact in the digital world, 
and in the health world and in many others is just really going to be changed. So next week or so we've got somebody coming in who can give us a pretty good picture of not only the things that are happening in that world but also some of the threats and problems. So in all of that, as another thing I learned in the aerospace world was how many interactions there were between people that were working on building one airplane and they were something like 6,000 people all together, you know, 6,000 companies all together working in sort of a web to, to be able to design and manufacture and field support the, these aircraft. And this just stunned me. I, I knew it you know, intellectually, sort of that they were interdependent, but not that scale in the kind of things that you'd need when you were working together in that way. So this, this really firmed up pictures like like you've got to have standards for the way your knowledge packages are made so it doesn't matter whose support tools they're paying by, you know, using, the same, the same packages will work. And then also as the evolution of a lot of functionality of those packages are going to start having more and more neat sophisticated properties in them with ability to twiggle them so that you get capabilities for manipulating and viewing and processing those that you want. And those have to evolve as an open vocabulary too and process. So this, this came to be this open hyper document system. So anyway, when we look at A and that's the complexity of going after that, so oh, you're trying to go after a real improvement in the world for the collective capability for handling complex urgent problems. And by the time you dig into that a while, you find that that's a very complex problem, scaled up to be very complex. And you say, how urgent is it? Well, then you look at the rate at which you know, complex, urgent problems are rising in the world, created to a large extent by the same technologies that offer us the possibility to improve these capabilities. Anyway, you say, hey, that's a complex, urgent problem. So how do we get the world to say it's urgent in a way in which they will all go for hunting for a strategic approach rather than hammering away at the front with the way it's been doing now? So another big step was then in looking at the capability infrastructure and saying at what level in that in infrastructure would you find the composite capability that provides how, how that organization can improve its own capabilities, its in, in, improvement, its, how can it improve its improvement capability infrastructure. <laughs> anyway, so this is the kind of thing that says, oh, so when you're trying to go out and improve capabilities in a fairly basic way, you realize that the ability, capability for organizations to improve themselves is an extremely important one. And it also, whether it's that high in an organization or not, it also is something that uses many of the same subordinate capabilities as other top level capabilities do. So you said, oh, if we give special attention to the capabilities that support that, then we'll, uh, will sort of have a lot of value because that cross-section of capabilities can come back and be improving the rate at which we can improve. And that can claim, maybe this is an organization whose primary purpose is, how do I improve the ability of organizations to deal with complex, urgent problems? And if I have my own ability to improve my capability, if I'm enhancing that with the same products I'm putting out, the feedback is what we call bootstrapping. And so the, the better I get at getting better, that's going to make me better at getting better. So try that on sometime. <laughs> I usually I'll, I'll always say, hey, I'll, I'll see if the, if the guys at the gym would listen to this. And uh, I, over the years I've realized, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So here's some more of the concepts. Collective IQ. So to me that's very meaningful and we'll have some more discussion about it. And this other one that Kodiak is some term we'll come across and these terms are called dynamic knowledge repository is a very, very important thing. Interoperability is very important. We've always seen that. And the bootstrapping. These are all concepts and we're going to have to come back to them over and over again in here in order for them to start interlinking in a way in which you show how they make a conceptual framework they also make a strategic framework that's important. And 
And it would be very important if we get more dialogue with thoughtful people in the world that say, if this is too rough and simple a picture, then could it be evolved in order to get one that will fit and work? If it isn't. So it's going to take help in there. I'm asking for help. So anyway, we talked about this exploding rate of change, rate and scale of change, that also brings problems. So all right, uh, look at the energy situation, the education situation that came out, but also opportunities. So we're looking at that and says, let's, let's take a special look at the opportunities for changing that world like this. So anyway, out of this came looking at the thing we're going to call collective IQ. So people working together depend on collective knowledge, and in the past it's been mostly written. If it was any size of a group, it, a lot of that had to be in writing, in interaction. So then you say, okay, that if that gets into the more active world of today, you can talk about, well, you could have at any given time. You look at this collective intelligence of any organization, has to, it has to be active at going out and looking at the world and understanding what the world has in the way of opportunities and threats, etc., and uh, how, how they can analyze that in order to adjust the behavior that they're doing and the weather structure and the role they have in the life. And so there'll be dialogue going along that people used to have to remember and then they could later they'd have written down to some extent. And they're always collecting information about the outside world, so you can do that in a much more comprehensive way in the forthcoming years with the technologies there. And at any given time, here's the operative knowledge that we have in there about which I can, using that knowledge, I can, the organization can operate. And so he says, well, in that airplane sort of picture, where did you go to look if you wanted to know what the latest design, you heard that they were going to modify the uh, stress members in one of the, wing, in the wings. And uh, hey, you, you got to, you got to go out on bid to try to get them made, and somebody was talking about making them change, so where do I find that? Well, if you weren't in the meeting or something, or you didn't know how to go look in the diagrams or in the CAD system, trouble. So these things are what you need to know with a bigger, bigger, more dynamic sort of operation. Just has to be able to go find out what's the status, and that's generally generated by what you find out from the outside world, and then everybody talking about it. And part of the dialogue is talking about the current state of your knowledge product. And so, anything in here, a drawing from here, or a diagram, or a chapter, or a section, or a, a set of requirements or something, is going to move over to the, be part of the dialogue because discussion about it caused it to be updated and the old one moved out. What you'd want to do because if you couldn't go back and find out why did we change that, which I've heard stories about in aircraft, you know, you know, three years out there they start developing some really serious problems. Well. They thought of some solution. Well, somebody says, hey, that was thought about and rejected because da-da-da. Well, that's very rare you'd find the guy available like that. So how do you go back and find out what was the dialogue about the design and how many designs were rejected and was this one one of them and why was it rejected, etc. Do we know more now? So if you can't go pick up that kind of issue development and watch the trail of it, you're losing a lot. So there are techniques people came out with maybe a, a half a decade or more ago and that they, they call it information-based information system where they were really tracking the issues and what they would happen to like that so that the technology today would make that ever easier. And that ought to be just a basic part of what the dialogue is on, on any kind of issues, you know. There I even say that the issues being brought up in our legislature and uh, the reasons why decisions were made. And uh, that's pretty sneaky because we have a state legislator here and he's incognito, so I won't point him out. Uh, but maybe he'd later like to tell us what it's like. What are the chances that the lawmaking activities of our countries and states and cities could be improved? So this point over here is saying concurrently Integrating, collaborating, developing, learning, and reusing is very important. And we've started isolating the basic set of capabilities it would take to do this. And um, so then the big, big, big thing that you realize after a while is, oh, almost every organization you know of has to be in some kind of bigger organizational network with other organizations. And that 
composite organization in turn has to be having this kind of dynamics going on. And its dynamic, its stuff here is really made up of comp parts of almost all of those. And so they're all evolving concurrently with certain kinds of interdependence in them. And that's a big, big, big challenge. See? So you realize that people doing one kind of research uh, find out that over in another domain there's research that changes, they learn more about biochemical tracing or something. And oh, that would just change immensely our models of what we were doing and things like that. So, so that's a very important thing. So actually, this really ends up that so much of the knowledge in the world is interrelated like that, that, that there really have to be ways in which this concurrency, so it's this dynamic knowledge repository that we've been calling that, and the fact that it has to evolve concurrently with all the things going inside and with all of the external relationships it has to maintain. So we've isolated, in, in just a, <clears throat> a term that's easy enough to pronounce and remember, of Kodiak is an acronym for the kind of capabilities an organization needs to have. It's got to be able to concurrently develop, integrate, and apply the knowledge in there like that. Well, that sounds like a simple thing, but the more you look at that in deeper sense, you realize it's a terrific challenge, and you don't get much of that in the literature today about how knowledge work and group work are doing. So how, how does a group show us that it is collectively smarter? Well, these are two pretty apparent things. So it, it learns more quickly, and it remembers its past experiences and actions better. So how would you know if an organization in which you're interested, concerned, is actually doing any better on this? So one thing that comes out of this pretty soon is we have to develop ways to go assess organizations of various kinds to see, sort of get an IQ test for them. And it's serious, we have to. So here's some of the things you'd have to find out. Here's something else. It integrates the innovative and cognitive capabilities of its members more effectively. So, you know, how, how well does a football team work? Well, this is exactly right. <laughs> Somehow you, you have a set of players and their capabilities and, and uh, pluses and minuses are knit together in the way in which they play and design and stuff. And it understands its own makeup and capabilities better if it's just blindly chugging along. So anyway, many of the old models of, of organization and finding a fixed role for somebody, etc., were quite effective at the time, of course, but what are you going to do about it when, when the way of communicating and developing and using knowledge is changing somewhat? So another thing about Collectively Smarter, it sees and understands more about what's going on in its environment. And you say, if you've got a very perceptive, intelligent person, that's what you pick up from them, too. They see something and they immediately extrapolate and figure out, okay, what that implies. And it's just very important. So the ones that don't, the stolid ones like that, you can't depend upon for sort of keeping up with what they need to know as they're in the world. A smart group also recognizes more quickly and understands more perceptively any external threats and opportunities. So that means what kind of subtlety does it have? If it sees some dynamic in the outside world that someone else might pass up and they automatically ex extrapolate that to say what the consequences would that be in some first or second order measure like that. So how smart are they? So that's pretty good. So you remember last week I talked about the colony of ants that had really figured out how to be very healthy and everything and they they got their nest bigger and bigger and bigger until it broke the branch and dropped them all in the water and they drowned and stuff. Well, you look at our current society and how much does it recognize and assess the kind of things that are happening in the environment, etc. And so when Hugh and Ed talk about energy later this afternoon, all point at them, everybody point at them to say, okay, so how well does the world recognize the nature of that, especially the ones that are going to have to start doing something about it? And can you tell us who are the ones that in a practical way can do something about it, except people that <coughs> the rabble risers, rousers that'll go around and try to get people's attention on it by picketing, etc., which is a very important thing. So anyway, so anyway, another thing, be collectively smarter. So in responding to a threat or opportunity, a smart one can generate a new plan of action more cleverly and comprehensively. See, that's, well, that's intelligence for a person. So anyway, that's, 
am I good at just blundering right straight ahead, or can I be more subtle about it and get the thing solved at the same time embellish something that we needed to do anyway? You can also apply and continuously coordinate its resources more smoothly and effectively. So every time I think of this kind of a thing here, I think of a running back in football. They just so quickly they sense of what's happening in the dynamics and so quickly they can reorganize and shift where they're running and dodging, etc. It's just a marvel. So he says, okay, any organization you know of that can any way give you a semblance of that kind of fluid sort of intelligence and coordination, that's what a really good nervous system can do for you. So anyway, we shift over to more of the concepts and vocabulary. So the sense where you talk about what the world needs ahead of time someday is this thing called an open hyperdocument system. So <clears throat> this term came out for me in about 13 to 15 years ago from the, in the aerospace world when we looked at that diagram of how many 6,000 companies and realizing <clears throat> if they're going to get beyond the primitive stage, they just have to be able to have documents that that and plans and designs that are transferable and everybody can read and work with them and those are standard. They just they just cannot have it be that they're locked in in some proprietary way. So it's just I think of it a lot of times as oh that'd be like our vocabulary is very important as we're learning how to talk about all sorts of things in our world. So what if it was that people could lock up the use of certain words etc. You can't use that verb in these nouns because I got them patented, and I'm going to lock them in. So it's sort of like that. You just the proprietariness has its very much importance, but somehow that has to be watched, or the inhibition it's going to cause about the evolution of this hugely important basic thing of how well does our society evolve its knowledge and harness it and use it and grow it, etc. So anyway, so along with that becomes a vocabulary. See, the, the nouns are what are the properties and characteristics of those knowledge packages. And the verbs are what can you do? How can you move it, show it, view it, manipulate it, process it, query it, da da da, all these actions, the verbs. And so those have to become relatively common too. They may be, of course, translated into other languages, etc. But, but you, you've just got to be able to talk to people in the same language about it. If you, if you couldn't talk about uh, the actions you take in your kitchen, you know, the, which objects you use to put together to, uh, and the uh, verbs you use for what you're doing with it, etc. It'd be hugely a tough world. <clears throat> so anyway, in this open source evolution that we're going to talk about a number of times in, in this process, and Peter Neumann mentioned it last week about the software issue of reliability and security that the kind of need for that and the way the software evolves. And here it also is the need for that if you're going to get the verbs of your dynamic knowledge environment so they evolve coherently and cleverly, etc. It has to be an open way in which those evolve and the way in which implementing those verbs in your software just, just has to be an open process for a lot of evolution out there. And the multiple classes of user interfaces, we'll talk about that later on in an explicit way. But that's just terribly important. Because that this, well, these, some people won't have as big a vocabulary in knowing what a bunch of the nouns are like in their knowledge packages. Or a bunch of the verbs, that they know what they can do. But they learn what they need to know. If they don't want to learn more, okay. So others, though, you can't let the rest of the evolution for people that want to do specialty things, etc., be limited because that's the only vocabulary you're going to be allowed about the nouns about what your knowledge packages have in them and the verbs about what you can do to them. This just cannot possibly get stayed like it is limited to the one kind of graphic user interface that's prevailing today. And so anyway, and the way to invoke it. So anyway, so we talk about that augment system just not to say it represents the future. It just represents steps toward the future that haven't been thought about today. So its value to us, it will be just in pointing that out. And if we can get the right technology together, we could actually demonstrate some of these things, which would be really, really fun. But just saying, okay, this, 
this and some of the dimensions that we're talking about as they move out. It had to do without the kind of graphic software and hardware capability that you could do today, but it would do some very interesting things. And so we keep moving. So there is a question about as you get early improvements in the capabilities, in this Kodiak capabilities you were talking about, how are you going to deploy those? Where are you going to put them to work? And who are the people doing what that it would be best pay off to help move ahead, ahead of where everybody else is so that you get some exploring in the future? So that's, that's an issue that needs thoughtful discussion. So we're going to try to get to it in ways that are meaningful too. And then we talked about improvement communities, and we're going to go through that again, and a networked improvement community, and what a, those are called NICs, and what a MetaNIC was, the NIC whose members are NICs. So we'll actually step through those pictures again today, because all of these comprise sort of part of that framework that keeping talking about them and their interrelations is what seemed necessary. So anyway, <clears throat> then I want constantly to be sliding up the scale and talking about, hey, whatever we do about these this kind of strategy and infrastructures at the scales we can manage today, <clears throat> the real value to the world is going to come as if you evolve those so they're scalable up to national and global scales so that the improvement infrastructures you can talk about can be at that scale. So that's not generally the case. And how do you get a state or a federal government of any nation or something like that to sort of start thinking about it on that basis. So that's one of the paradigm challenges we've really got is saying, oh, you know, already our government's put in quite a bit of money to improve things with research and medicine and education and defense department and aerospace. <clears throat> and they give out grants a lot to people doing scientific studies. And uh, so which of those might we find that are investing in something this strategic scale here? And it doesn't turn out that, that the sort of way in which they do their, their business of developing programs and going out there is sort of oriented about this. So it'd be very, very important to get enough dialogue going to see if a case can be made within those kind of agencies and the resources. And the same thing can be said about uh, the sort of um, not-for-profit philanthropic organizations that have a fair amount of money to put out, how do they decide where they can invest it to most advantage? So they have one thing usually that they'll say, because oh, they can be more independent, sort of like that, well, I'm really interested in the environment. I think it's a really a serious issue. And uh, so they can go invest in all sorts of special studies or movements or something about helping the environment. But wouldn't it be nice to give them a framework in which you could say, one thing you could do is an invest in the kind of capability improvements that when you plug those into your other ventures are going to make whatever you'd like to do about the environment or health or education, make that a lot more effective investment. See? So that's the kind of thing that, that the strategy would offer. And so it'd be very handy if the paradigms and the vocabulary out here in the world would get us to the point where we can actually address that with the executives and the decision makers about where resources go when they're trying to invest in improving our organizations, our problems, etc. So <clears throat> to me it's, it's important, and I'll constantly keep coming back to this national and global level of scaling, that, that the kind of things that we're facing are something that, that we have to get better at dealing with things at those scales, because it's, it's so effective to everybody. It's like those ants must have been, might have been very, very good about how they do better structuring and waterproofing their, their home and getting food. But if they didn't know enough about looking at overstressing the branch and they all drowned, how much could it do them to get better at the things that they did get better? So we come back then to this thing of, there's, there's my, this figuratively speaking, the improvement, inf you know, the improvement infrastructure within the capability infrastructure. Now I put it up there just so we could talk about it more clearly, but where does that fit in most organizations, in most institutions, etc.? Well, it's been semi-dormant, quite a low level for most of the years through 
and a lot of the changes they make are sort of some kind of organic evolution. Oh, they invented elevators. Okay, so then people slowly start building higher rise, and then there are things that start happening that they get more clustering because it's value to them of living, you know, working in higher rise or even living in it. And so it changed a lot in our society, but it did so much of it organically that it wasn't anything that they thought ahead and needed to go. So if things are happening more rapidly and more extreme, you're just going to have to find better ways to think ahead in order to know how to do with them. That maybe taking advantage of this thing and going in that direction, boy, that'd be very dangerous unless at the same time you're doing this and this. See, well, who's, who's thinking? So anyway, so anyway, it, it is likely that this bootstrap improvement strategy could start and could work at small scales. But if we're serious about the scale of mankind's complexity urgency situation, then we should begin by considering the scale at which the solution strategy must in the end be suitable for. So this is the sort of thing we come through to. So very clever strategy, Doug, but uh, you know, it might be good for, for how we improve the way we do our our refuse disposal, but what, what's there in the world? <laughs> this is, well, is it going to be able to help the energy problem, the education problem, the health problem, the environment problem, or any of the 15 things that are listed in that Millennium Project that Jerry Glenn was talking about? And he'll be back in a few weeks to, he and Peter are going to give a special, special presentation to the group here. But that's one of the questions to ask is, what in that environment are we going to have to get better at coping with? So one of them is energy. So we got this, these specialists here today. So by the end of today, we won't have to worry about energy anymore, I think. <laughs> I'm, is it okay if I advertise you like that? See, one of the problems here is I've known Hugh Crane there for 43 years. And, uh, and he was... He was a nice, honest engineer at the time. <laughs> <coughs> so, what about national improvement infrastructures? So there was a big push some years ago about the NII in our country, and that was a national information infrastructure. So we say, what if we refurbished that term and gave it a new definition, calling it a national improvement infrastructure, and went up to Congress and said, hey, this would be an important thing, don't you think? Let's, let's get behind it. So what would you say to them? So that's what would be very much worthwhile, in my estimation, if, if together interested parties could learn how to phrase it to point out that the, what the sort of the uh, value propositions and the needs, et cetera, are in terms that could be understood there. So this has always been sort of a depressing thing for me that Year after year, I proved that I'm the worst salesman in the world. <laughs> See, <laughs> that uh, I just could not sell these things. So I'm really almost embarrassed that I'm asking you people to, to watch and listen to this thing because obviously it's not very good because it hasn't sold, or I'm not very good. So anyway, how do you get to do that? And so how soon will it be feasible to plan and establish uh, a national NIC? or a multinational NIC of nation NICs, which in the end is going to have to be there too. See? So anyway, for the rest of the colloquium, these things are started pushing and motivating me all the time, is talking about we can go this way or that way, how would you deploy early gains, you know, thinking about it in the kind of a strategy that can really do what we're talking about here. So we'll review this again. You're going to come back to this thing quite a few times, I'm warning you. And then I'll give quizzes. See, so we talk about this is the start of talking about the infrastructure. It turns out because you want to look at different roles that are being played in that world. <coughs> so at any given time, the A activities out there are exercising the current capability infrastructure for doing your organization or running your university, whatever. And that any activity that's there to improve that. You'll just label that as a B category of activities. And quite often we, we point out over and over again, don't talk about the A guy and the B guy. It's somebody wearing an A hat or a B hat. Because very often 
you know, the committee of people trying to plan for an improvement are A guys and people that have to go in and get in the committee meeting and put on a B hat to talk about how they're going to improve the organization. And then the C is how do you improve the way you improve, which was never a big factor in which you chugged along without a the horizon wasn't very far off about where you're migrating to, so you could chug along with sort of the same method of organic ways of improving. But when it's getting way out there, what you have to know in the skills and capabilities in order to pick a new place for your organization to migrate to and how you get there is something that's going to take some new knowledge. So C becomes very important when you're doing this. So we talk about that. And so we said, look, one way of characterizing what C does is it's got to scout that frontier. See? And in the process, they might go so far as to drop the, all the organizations off the chart. But anyway, so out here, there are outposts out in that frontier. There may be, there ought to be, there needs to be. So what are they going to be and who's going to put them there and what are they going to be like? So that was one of the questions that feeds back to when we talked about how you deploy early improvements in your capabilities. Boy, it'd be great if the early improvements could be put out there and then you've got problems that go along with that is how do you, how do you link and integrate that kind of knowledge and capability into your existing organizations, what they are. So there are ways to do that if you shift things a little bit, etc., which would be extremely important because you know, if there's somebody trying to learn how to live under the sea in, in domes because we're going to have to move out there someday, a lot of us are, uh, this is a conjecture, so suppose we are in order to, to work in the world. So how are we going to do that? Well, you can imagine a whole bunch of scattered little people going down in wetsuits and, and setting up one person underwater camps for a week would be one thing. But what you have to do is really go down there and find out how people can live and work. So you've got to have outposts that are doing that. So who's going to do it and fund it? And how are you going to sort of sense that that's real work? Well, hell, nowadays you want to communicate and be interacting with the rest of the world. So it is there. Or how about colonies out, out in space? How are they going to interact and work? So anyway, these are like colonies, outposts out in the frontier, and the rest of us are living back here. And we got to learn from those guys where we're going to want to go. So that means whatever they're doing, it'd be very, very handy if that was relevant to our world and related. Well, the way the world's working today and can work with the technology, they could actually be working in your organization, living out there. So that's a kind of a thing for which this multi-class of user interface, etc., and multi-grades of user skills, etc., can work and it would take thinking about how you run your organization's knowledge work in order for that to happen. But I tell you, from our own experience, if you're working on the same problems and projects somebody that's working on there that's got that kind of capability, and they can stop and show you, etc. You remember I told you how even in 1974 we had the capability for, if anybody in the country working on our system that was on the ARPANET, they wanted help, they could call us up and pretty soon our screens would be locked together so I could sit there and watch what their problem is and I could say, pass me the controls, I'll show you how to do it. See? So that's what you want and that did more for helping users at all levels learn because somebody <coughs> could come fit, be right there effortlessly from any distance and could watch what you do and not only show you or tell you but could actually show you and then say, you try it. So this is a way in which if you can actually have people <coughs> showing you that are at a grade three user skill level and you're at a grade two or even a one, you know, that'll be just a terrific experience for you to see what they're able to do in your knowledge domain to give you some support when you're watching like that and feeling. So that's the, the way of transferring the knowledge both ways from these advanced sort of user experimental things into the today world. It's just extremely important and there's a way to show that later on. So about these outposts, they're just a very, very important sort of thing. And so the B guy, excuse me, I did it. <coughs> the B activity <coughs> is, that's the equivalent of the guy that can organize a wagon train and take everybody out there. 
So how do you move your organization like that? See, so I sort of, in a way, I think about that as this. I've been wandering around that frontier for years, and of course, the reason why I'm not very effective in anything else is because I've been spending all my time on the more important things. Of course, well, the f real fact is that I'm just no good at all at organizing wagon trains. I, I like the animals and I like the details and I would get all hung up fixing a wagon wheel instead of figuring out where we ought to be by tonight. See, so I, I got a head that doesn't work well in today's organization. So in, in a way, what you could immediately deduce is I had to invent this kind of strategic future so I'd have something to do and talk about and just as long as I don't have to do anything practical. So it turns out I, I can do practical things if they're down and focused. And I can invent. So anyway, I've got a photograph of me when I was like 15, doing something every day for me in an environment that was my environment at the time, but would look very strange to you guys, most of you, and which was part of what my sort of orientation was in high school. And looking around the other people, they were just different from what I was like, because I lived and came from this other environment. And I didn't think of it, except I'm different. See? So, okay, I stagger through life. All right, so I'm different. So I'm sitting there, and I haven't had a salary for a couple of years, but boy, look. And why, why don't you go to work? Well, look, every year sooner that the world picks up and does this thing could make a huge, huge difference. And if I believe it that much, I just couldn't ever sit down and, and let, wait for somebody else to do it. So the orientation that people have is very important. And it's important for you guys, and the ones out there too, which it's interesting to think that they're watching. Hi Dave in Australia. <laughs> he tells me he saw that, which is great. So we have somebody in Switzerland and Norway, also they're tuning in, that'd be great. But the, the, uh, the, the, what I really don't want is when people listening and watching this to think that that in some way I'm a proven genius that knows all this, or in some way I'm a proven misfit and am no good. Just let it be in between that say, here are these ideas and concepts, and let's talk about them and see if you've got alternatives and better, and see, in the first place, if you don't believe that this world is getting more complex and f moving faster, et cetera, at a dangerous rate, well, then you probably aren't motivated much to get off your horse and do something about it. So how do, we, how do we start there and do that? So this is, this is a problem. And if we have the right kind of dynamic knowledge repository and the right kind of support staff, we could actually be eliciting that from all those people out there. So we're not yet. So then we had this other step that was very important about saying, oh, one thing is you probably can find quite a few other organizations who are supporting different people as customers or users government agencies supporting the, the, the uh, citizenry, what have you. And you says, look, we all find out that we've got a real worry about how we get our bees capability moved up. And we're not likely, sometimes they aren't used the same in our A work. And sometimes our A work is something we don't want you to know about. But look, getting better bees that know better about the world is important. You know, how to choose where to go. And so, I be, even though we're competitors, we better go the same way in some of these capabilities or we won't even be able to talk to each other and stuff like that. So, that's why you find that the C stuff is just a very important stuff that you can actually move to this stage in what we call an improvement community. Sometimes we call it a C community. That say, hey, a fair amount of what that C activity is is something which not only we could save money on by sharing it among a group, but we would come out ahead. Whatever inve we invested together like that, the collective investment could do a lot better than each of the independent ones doing that. And so then you could say, okay, we've got consultants that do that. We says, all right, let's just look though at the kind of thing that you could build on here. That if you say, this C community, talk about a place to invest what early improvements you have in this kind of knowledge work, et cetera. Hey, investing them inside of C communities, that's part of your in improvement infrastructure. That's what would really pay. So hey, let's just learn how to cultivate 
an effective knowledge repository and do the kind of dynamic Kodiak work we're talking about here inside of that one. Because again, as I mentioned before, this is like an outpost. So this is, you know, quite a bit ahead of what all of these are doing at the same time in doing the work, the common work about scouting the future, doing the scenario developments, doing the collection of intelligence, integrating it, and analyze it, fitting it there, and the business about showing people that who should staff this. So then this comes out if you think about it further. Oh, one reason why this community could be more effective for its problem than consultants are that your own B guys and C guys could be spending a fair amount of time moving in and working in that environment and then coming back. See, it's an environment you're going to invest in anyway, so why not also invest by having your people go and spend it? So it does a fair amount of good while they go collect together until they get to know each other better, and then they can do a lot of that from their own home offices, but, but that'd be a very, very important process for what's learned in here and the experience to get transferred. So it's like, hey, the new kind of B person, given that kind of experience and knowledge base, when they come to A's and say, hey, you know, do they come and say, let me tell you how you should change your work. As contrast is, let me show you how. Because in this environment, we're doing it in a very effective way. We show you and give you the feeling about it. We may want to move in a slightly different direction, but showing you rather than telling you about it. So then you says, okay, the consultants could do that too, right? And I say, yeah. So you tell me how many consulting big organizations are going to say, well, you come in and see how well we do our collective work. That'll convince you. And almost everybody I talk to inside of any of the organizations that are selling and promoting hardware, people wear, et cetera, on this, they would be embarrassed to death if you actually went in and did an assessment of how they do their internal collective knowledge work. So one of the really interesting things about this would be, oh, what if you ask organizations that are trying to sell the world the latest in not only the hardware but the software so you can do this or that, you can do your beautiful enterprise resources working, da da da. So he says, okay, have an open house so you can we can talk to the people inside your organization that are using it, employing all these different things. And obviously then this would really teach us where we want to go. So, you know, I've been talking about that kind of a suggested challenge for quite a few years and it uh, somehow doesn't seem to be grabbed with much enthusiasm. It's much easier to, to have their, their uh, marketing people make up the very nice ads that give the impression of how zooty you'll be doing your work, etc. if you use their product. So anyway, so there's one thing that a community like this would do is they're living, they'd be living it and for real and learning the lessons about where to go, how hard it is, and they could bring, consultants could come in to them and tell them like that, but they'd be much more critical than about saying, well, well, show me, don't just tell me, see. Okay, so that's a very big important thing. So, but how to make these NICs work, it's a, it's a consortium-like thing and there are a lot of experience in running consortia. But in this case, where there's this interchange of people, et cetera, to, to make it really work right, it's a different sort of thing. So how do you present the, a plan for this to people inside of pressured organizations to say, get the resources that you put in the dollars, the money to really be able to have this thing be very dynamic ahead and also the people interaction have to be committed or you're not going to get it. So how do you make that value proposition to people? So we need to have people from different environments like that that start thinking about this. You know, if you're from a school environment, K-12, or the, the people that are running school districts, or the school boards, or something of that sort, you've got one set of problems. Where do your resources come? How could you staff together? And if you're running, huh, these are, these are states. Each one of them has a similar kind of problem in how they really get modern and effective about the way they do all sorts of things in their executive, judicial, and legislative operations. And so, hey, this could be a state model. Oh, well, how do they get their particular legislators to vote for this kind of expense when, hey, <coughs> maybe the, <coughs> excuse me, you know, what they hear from 
advisors who happen to come and the ones that pay, write checks for the support of them like this, but also uh, are ones that can afford to have lobbyists in there like that, and say, hey, you know, look, the consultants do right, da 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 These vendors out there have got the scale. Don't bother getting into this. So anyway, what, how do you present the story? So this is the kind of thing which getting this kind of operation going for sizable scale improvement communities and NICs are going to face. So anyway, we, we've tried and so it's just, it, it's just going to take more people who are knowledgeable about each of those domains, et cetera, to start getting it working. It's going to take some people investing in it. And the investment can't be of the kind which a lot of the products have to be is, well, we're going to put out, ask for proposals and they will be peer reviewed. So I've got quite a bit of experience about peer review. That if the peers have all been living in this same domain, and their assessment then is very valuable, stuff like that. But if the paradigms are suddenly shifted and they don't have experience in a domain that's different like this, like if people don't have experience in any underwater sea things to any great extent, except maybe they go scuba diving, etc., how are they going to be a peer reviews for saying, I want to put these, we've got to get these domes in there and learn how to live? Yes, that's right. Well, we'll write a, a program prescription and send out uh, and inv invitations to bid on it, and then we'll have peer review select which of those seem to be the more realistic. So, anyway, and it's sort of like, it's sort of like in the in the military in the army. You know, I, I I was very interested in hearing the difference between tactical commanders at different levels, a sergeant or a colonel or something. The difference among them in how they had to think as contrasted to the difference in the strategic guy that says it's important to take that hill. Tactical guys love a thing like that. To get halfway up the hill, Jesus, hey, we want more resources, resource, we need them, we need them. And the strategic guy says, if you consume more resources, the strategy falls apart, we won't have enough to take the next step. So you either make it or we're not going to throw any more in. And the tactical guy just feels like he's been really ruptured and just like that. So these, there's a difference in this. So where do we find the people that look at these things strategically? So that's the question. So then the thing about, we talk about here is if that Nick idea works, what about a Nick whose members are Nicks? The thing here is how do you get to be a better Nick? See? So there are lots to learn. This one may have a governance process that's quite different from this and different from this. And oh, that process seemed to be a lot more effective in kind of making the right kind of decisions about doing here. Or on the other hand, this, this guy here has a better way for educating or something like that. Or how do it, does it knowledge management or something like this. So anyway, this is just as important in any other set of organizations as far as Nick's getting to be better by form, part, you know, sharing their C work in another Nick. And the different thing here, though, is that, you know, it sort of says to people, well, this is a little extreme, isn't it? He says, no. <coughs> if it's as important as we think it is for people to learn how to work collectively better, these guys all have distributed communities out there themselves, which is very important. So it'd be just very much important to learn. So these things could be professional societies, because those are improvement communities, which is just extremely important. And some of them in medicine, or professional societies in the American, I mean, the Association for Computing Machinery. You know, that the, some of the special interest groups in them, the Association for Computing Machinery is sort of like this, that each of its, you know, special interest, each of its special interest groups is, uh, is uh, essentially a, an ick. So for them to start converting, it's a real problem. So. I've got a commitment from the president of the Association for Computing Machinery, which is the biggest computer association in the world, to come and, and interact with us if we, if we behave ourselves later. So here's, a, here's an issue about in evolving those communities. So every NIC has a capability involving community out there, and it's evolutionary human system working inside of that thing. And it's got an evolutionary set of tools that's working with. 
and working on the community's dynamic knowledge base. So they're all sort of evolutionary concepts and practices as well as the tools, functions, and all of that that it can do. And the documentation standards are the, uh, like that. So it takes these three kind of things all evolving along with the praxis for doing that. Thing. So this is sort of a model and we'll talk about that later because one of the models of being able to plug this into the way in which Nick's work and the way in which the OHS evolution could take place would be very, very important. So a lot of this comes about that if what you're doing inside different members are doing things to improve its own activity that also would improve the neck like that, this makes it uh, the right bootstrapping. So that's a way for showing that. And then the international scene that uh, a little over a year ago, the Japanese chapter was formed, and Professor Ohashi showed us a little slide here and came last week. But that's a very important model is, hey, how could they interact till they really get to be a national scope information improvement infrastructure? And what other countries can we interact like this? So we're going to have some discussions coming up like this, and this one sort of fell through, so we won't bother about that. So Jim Spohr, is going to right after the break, which we start in five minutes or something, is is going to give us a talk. Who, <coughs> loosely speaking, it's about worldwide improvement community that he helped fa establish, called Education Object and Economy, which has some very unique things, and as well as general uh, considerations about the improvement infrastructure. And then following that, and when they do that, they're going to sit here and run their own slides, and then we'll have some dialogue afterwards, and. Um, then Hewitt Crane, and he's, he's a colleague of Ed Kinnerman who talked last week. So Hugh Crane has another set of slides to talk about it too, and we'll all expect the more insights about the energy coming from that. And so, so we'll have structured dialogue and question and answers, if fall goes well in that. And so this is the end. So you are now free to move around, it says. <laughs> so we'll be back together again for these other presentations, and thank you. Thank <laughs> you.